So, uh, yesterday, a good friend of mine in another part of the country sent me uh, on WhatsApp, on my phone, sent me a Christmas photo of himself and his young family. And the caption wished us a happy Christmas. You might have had messages like that this morning or last night on your phones or some other way, received a Christmas card perhaps. Maybe sometimes you get cards, don't you, with people's picture on the front of them. But certainly he sent me this photo of the three of them, him and his wife and their little boy, and all three of them were wearing amazing Christmas jumpers. Oh. Okay, so I can see that some of you have gone for that trip today. No, I don't have one. Maybe next Christmas you want to buy me one. But I, I don't think I'll beat Joe, who's dressed as an elf today, which is fantastic. Um, but uh, Christmas jumpers, what a thing that is. And uh, as he sent me this, I, I sent a kind of teasing comment back to him about these, these Christmas jumpers. And he took it, of course, in, in good spirit. Yeah. But he also said that some Christian friends of his, to whom he'd sent a very similar photo last year, yeah. had been so offended <laughs> by the photo that they told him not to send him one this year. <laughs> Can you believe it? Now, the reason was nothing to do with the jumpers. It was, he said, because he sent them Christmas Greetings. Yeah, what exactly? Because these particular believers, I'm sure they're true believers and lovers of the Lord Jesus Christ, they seem to think that because this particular cultural celebration is not in the Bible, it's not Christmas to celebrate like this, it's not in the Bible, even though what we're celebrating is in the Bible, because of that, or perhaps because they're in a free church like us, an independent church, and they think of Christmas as a kind of invader from the Church of England. But maybe they think that. Oh, that's a viewpoint I kind of share myself, and I'm glad to, to, to celebrate Christmas like this. Those dear people who sent that message back had been so offended by Christmas greetings that they asked to request no further communications. That, that amazed me. Don't send me any more of your pagan Christmas greetings. They just thought that was incredible. <laughs> Not only does that fail to show, sorry, fail to allow other Christians a degree of what we call Christian liberty, freedom to, to choose things which are not kind of resolutely set down one way or the other in the Bible. There's a denial of that in matters indifferent like this. But also, doesn't it just suck the joy out of what for us should be a time of true thanksgiving and celebration, even if, of course, the world is forgetting Christ? We don't need to. We remember Christ. We take the blessing of knowing what we're celebrating and who we're celebrating. We do that with joy and thanksgiving. It's just a good excuse, isn't it, to worship him again, if you, if you can put it like that. Because the scriptures are clear, right? God never wants his people to go joyless. He's the God of joy himself. He's the blessed God. He is the happiest being in the universe. That's who God is. And he wants his people to have the same joy. Christ himself says, Father, I would that my joy be in them as well. We're to share the joy of Christ. Especially if you're deliberately, intentionally marking the incarnation of the Son of God. The most stupendous event in the history of mankind. We should never be joyous. And that's why in Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, we're told what happened to the wise men when they came right up close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 2, verse 10, when they saw the star, that is when they saw it stopped over the place where the Messiah was, what happened? They were overjoyed. They were overjoyed. They didn't go, well, great, oh, we've completed the mission, excellent, we're here, we can go home again. They were emotional. They were happy. They were, this is amazing, we're here, the Messiah is here, and we found him. Isn't this a wonder? They were overjoyed. Now it's easy, isn't it, to kind of to point the finger a bit at, at what we might think of as joyless people, the kind of Grinches or the Scrooges of Christmas. But actually, we need to also let the finger kind of point back to us too. Because of course, Christmas we think of as a happy time, joyful time, in many ways it's true. But will you spend any of today with genuine joy in Jesus? Because of Jesus, not because you're getting presents, not because you're having your favourite food, but because Jesus is your saviour. That should be the thing which gives you the most joy today. And if it doesn't, then there's something as spiritually wrong with you as my friends, grouchy friends. 
Because joy should well up in us because of Jesus. I hope really that there will be that joy in us today. I hope it's in me. I hope I listen to myself preaching, if you like, and that I would enjoy Christ today and every day. I hope you will too. Let's see that in the major then, as the first of three things that they experience when they get to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so three things then, just to say, what did they experience? What happened to them when they met the infant Savior? The first thing is joy. Joy. And not just any kind of joy. Matthew uh, kind of heaps up words, certainly in the original text of Matthew. It's not quite so obvious in the NIV. It says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And it just translates one word um, for what's actually a whole heap of words in the original. Um, as I was translating it this week, I, I realised as you go along, it just like word as the word as the word as the word. It says, they rejoiced. That's not great. Rather than they rejoiced. Then it says, they rejoiced with joy. So in, in Greek, you can do that. They rejoiced with joy, which means they really rejoiced. And then it says, they rejoiced with great joy. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. They rejoiced with great joy. And then it got to the next word, and it said, exceedingly. They rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. That would be a more literal translation. It's, it's just... Over and over and over, Matthew's saying, they were really happy about this. They were over the moon. It made their day. Have you ever had exceedingly great joy? You might have not put it that way, because of course in modern English that sounds a bit clunky, and it is. Overjoyed is, is perhaps more appropriate for the way we normally speak. But even then, would you say, I, I was just overjoyed. It just absolutely filled me with with just terrific happiness. Have you ever felt like that about anything? Bowled over by delight. That's what we're being told happened to these wise men. What brought it on for them, seeing the Lord Jesus Christ? What might bring it on for you? England winning the World Cup? Maybe. People full of joy if England win a football match, let alone the final. They didn't get there this year. Of course, England did win the World Cup this year in the sport that mattered most. As you all know, the Cricket T20 World Cup. <laughs> they did, and I had joy about that. Because that's more my thing. And you probably know that about me, given all the football. And actually, I should, I should be honest about this. When the England cricket team achieved another famous victory, David and I were texting each other about it, and we were saying, this is just amazing. And literally, when they won a few weeks ago, I actually punched the air. I actually did. <laughs> and I have to ask myself, I can get that excited about cricket, which is here for a while, and then it, you know those players will be gone, and England will get back again. If I can get that excited about cricket, I have to ask myself whether my salvation in Jesus ever, <coughs> makes, me, ever makes me do that, feel that enough joy to punch the air, enough joy to say, "Thank you, you're so good, you're so wonderful." He can. Create that kind of joy. He did for the wise men. He should for me and for you. Because that's how good he is. I hope that you might even have just a glimmer of the kind of joy that Jesus brings today. Because it will take you to a, a level of satisfaction in God. Which you can't create through other Christmas stuff. Real joy in Christ. If you're struggling to think, oh, am I really ever joyful in Christ? Just... Pause and meditate and think on what he's done for you, on what he's suffered for you, and how he's taken your place on the cross. Think about how he's intervened in your life now, where you used to be, what kind of person you were. Think of what kind of person you are now as you're in Christ. What a change! Think about where you were headed to hell, and where you're headed to resurrection life and new creation. Think about that. Think about what patience he's shown you when you've made such messes of loving him and putting him first. How patient he's been. How he's drawn you back. How he's not let you go. How he's kept you. When you were sinning or when you were down and low. When you were rebelling against his grace or when circumstances just got too much for you. He was still there, wasn't he? And he's still keeping you. And how he's forgiven you. And how he's sanctified you and made you more like himself. And how he's prepared a home in heaven for you. And all the things you can think of. That, if you meditate on those things for a moment, you think, yes, I have joy in him. Oh, I, I pray. You can pray for joy today. 
Fruit of the Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you love, joy, peace, patience, and all else that comes from knowing Christ. I don't generally read newspapers a great deal, but um, I did see an article this week from a newspaper I don't generally read, The Guardian. I saw an article uh, from The Guardian a couple of days ago by a lady called Polly Toynbee. You might have heard of Polly Toynbee. She's the Vice President of Humanist UK. And uh, you might kind of then graph where she might come from on certain things to do with Christianity. And the headline of the article, the title of the article was this, Christmas comes with good cheer. The tragedy is the religious baggage. <laughs> now, by religious baggage, of course, she means anything to do with Jesus. She thinks that is just, that gets in the way of really enjoying yourself at Christmas. The religious baggage. And in the article, she kind of tries to say that uh, Christmas really is wonderful. It's a great time of year, as long as you keep all this Jesus nonsense out of it. And don't think about any of that religious stuff. Uh, but you know, if you look up the article yourself, you know sometimes they have the photo of the person writing the article at the top of the header. And I just thought the real tragedy is that even dear Polly's face in the photo was just pinched and sad and mean. It's just that, like there was just no joy in it at all in that face. Even in the article itself, for all its claims of good cheer and all its aims at having a nice time, but it's no wonder. If you leave Christ out of Christmas, there won't be real joy in you, however much you try and manufacture it. This Christmas I, I gave a, a book as a present to one of my brothers. Um, he's, a, he's a history buff, he loves to read history. And so I, I found a, 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 a history book that particularly dealt with the time when he was a, a born, 1979 to 1982, by Dominic Sandbrook. And it was, I haven't read it, but it was highly recommended. And in this book about the period where he was born, it mentions Polly Toynbee quite a bit in the book. because She was around, she was a journalist at that time as well. And um, you can check out Polly Toynbee in the index. And before I wrapped it up and sent it to you, I, I looked up Polly Toynbee in the index. And it, it's, it's, it's great. It's like, I don't know whether it's great or sad, but this is the, these are all the references to Polly Toynbee in the index of that book. Polly Toynbee disapproves of Brixton Housing Block, page 249. Disapproves of Falklands War, page 771. Disapproves of king size prawns, page 127. <laughs> Disapproves of Mallorca, page 165. What? What Mallorca? And prawns. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, you know, that's, maybe that's slightly below the belt, I don't know. But every reference to it, she's disapproving of something. She's had the joy sucked out of her because she doesn't know the joy giver. The Lord Jesus. I wonder, have you, maybe for some reason, had the joy sucked out of you? Feed it back have it back through an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what happened to the wise men. That's the first thing they experienced. Joy. Let's pray for joy. Second thing. What did they experience? Worship. Worship. <coughs> Verse 11. <coughs> On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Now the familiarity of that scene to many of us should not blind us to the <coughs> shock of what is going on in that text. When it says they bowed down and worshipped him, you've got to remember that the person writing this is a Jewish man deeply versed in all the ways of Israelite religion, where there is literally only one person in the cosmos that it is ever right to worship. You've got to remember that a few chapters later in his gospel, he will quote with full and right approval the words of Deuteronomy 6.13, Worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That's what Matthew says. Chapter 4, verse 10. You've got to remember when you hear that they worship the baby Jesus. You've got to remember that when anyone else in the New Testament is approached with that same kind of attitude, and they are not God, they immediately tell the person who's fallen on their face before them, to get up and stop being so stupid. So when Cornelius comes to Peter in Acts chapter 10 and starts to bow down before him, literally worship him, Peter says, get up, I'm just a man like you. 
And when an angel, an almighty angel, is revealing uh, majestic things to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, more than once the angel says, what are you doing? Why are you worshipping me? Worship God alone. Even angels say that. Certain human beings. So, back to Matthew 2, verse 11, when we read that these wise men came, saw the child with his mother Mary, and bowed down, and worshipped him, worshipped him, then either Mary and Joseph should have dived in and intervened and said, whoa, steady on, stop that. Mm. Or Matthew should have explained away their folly for doing something which is completely unacceptable. Or the person in the trough is the Lord God Almighty. Mm. Now, I don't know how you, but I'm going for that last one. So should you. If you read on in Matthew's Gospel, you'll find that other people do that. Matthew particularly seems to like this. He says, that person worshipped him. That person worshipped him. That person worshipped him. So there's a leper, at least one leper, who falls down before him and worships him. Jairus, the synagogue ruler, falls down before him and worships him. The Canaanite woman with a demon-possessed child, remember her, falls down and worships him. The mother of James and John falls down and worships him. The two Marys, on their way back from the tomb, worship him. The disciples on the mountain of Galilee at the ascension worship him. Hey, Matthew isn't making a mistake. He's not saying, oh, huh, slip of the pen there. Shouldn't have put worship because he says it half a dozen other times in his gospel. They all worshipped him and Jesus never said, don't do that. I'm only a man like you. Of course, he is a man completely like us. And yet at the same time, he's somebody else. He's the God man. He's God and man in one person. And those people then all gave to him what you and me and everyone should only ever give to God himself. And that's right because that's who he is. So will you do that? Today if you don't worship Jesus as your God, you will definitely worship something else in his place and become an idolater and come under the curse of Deuteronomy 6.13 which says you shall worship the Lord your God only in him you shall you serve. And if we worship anything else apart from God, we're in huge trouble. You are. You won't do it today. It might be Christmas Day, but maybe today's the day you've got to get right with God and say, I've been worshipping myself. I've been worshipping my staff. I've been worshipping everything else. I've been worshipping the adulation of my workmates or my friends or my family. I've been worshipping anything but you, Jesus. What if that's you? Get right with him today. What? Maybe Christmas Day will be the day. You come to faith in Christ and say, not me anymore, but you, I give you the worship for the first time in my life. Either you'll be on the throne today or he will be. There's no middle ground. Got to have one or the other. Which is it going to be? Worship, I tell you. Worship is the way to joy. Worshipping him. Giving up on your own. So that's the second thing they experienced. Worship. They experienced joy when they came and met Jesus. They experienced worship. And so should we. Thirdly and finally, they experienced loss. They experienced loss. You might be you might be surprised to find me ending on that note. How could this wonderful encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ entail any kind of loss? I've been saying you get him, you get everything. It's wonderful, joy, worship, but now loss. You see, the truth is, actually, that every encounter with Jesus will, in will in involve some kind of loss, but a loss of the best kind. Jesus himself said, when he grew up into an adult, whoever loses their life for me will find it, Matthew 16, 25. The question is whether you're ready to undergo that loss yourself. So, how am I getting out of Matthew 2? Well, I mean, of course, that the wise men came to Jesus with something they had brought from their home, didn't they? They had chosen something special to give to the king. And then they did not take that special thing back with them on the return journey. Indeed, they could not take it back if they wanted to truly encounter Jesus as they ought. Because they realised that there were these precious things in their life that truly should be offered to him as a mark of their worship and respect and honour for the infant king. They brought their best. It says, verse 11, they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They brought their best, and they left them with Jesus. 
And then say, have this for a bit, okay? When you've enjoyed these little toys, you know, on Boxing Day, bring them back and we'll have them again. They said, have them and keep them because they belong to you. We give them up gladly to the Lord Jesus Christ because of who they knew him to be. No gift was too much. No loss was too great. Because of their joy, because of their worship, they said, we, we'll, we'll give it. That's fine. You have it. We don't mind losing that. Never having it back. Yours it is, and yours it should be forever. So, these gifts they bring, of course it was a sacrifice in one sense. Who knew what, what else they could have financed in their lives by this, these precious gifts? They would have been expensive. They could have gone home and said, well, I'll buy a new ox, or a whole load of oxen with this, or I can you know, repair the roof of my house, or whatever, but they didn't. They said, oh, we're just going to give it to a baby. We're going to lose that gladly for him. Doesn't seem like it does anything. Doesn't seem to accomplish anything. It's not very practical. Giving these gifts to a baby who can't understand what they're all about. They said, no. If you ask them, if you meet them, if you're there in a new creation, you meet the wise men, whether they were three or whether they were 25, who knows. If you meet them, they would tell you in a heartbeat that in reality it was no sacrifice at all. They'd say, Gain the whole world and yet forfeit our souls. Whatever. No thanks. Why should we have done that? The exchange. That was just infinitely worth it. The loss was the best loss we ever lost. They'll say. We gained him. More than that, he gained us. He gained our hearts, our worship. There's nothing better in all the world than that. We didn't keep anything back for ourselves. He became all we wanted and all we needed. They lost and because they lost, they gained everything. So will that be your attitude today? To say, well, actually, there are things I can give up for him. There are things which he needs to take precedence in. In this day, this final week of the year, as we head towards 2023, maybe you can make it your aim for the new year. To say that if I lose something for Christ's sake, then really it's me who's gained. If I lose my life for his sake, he says, I'll find it. I'll find my life if I, I'm willing to give it up for him. So I wonder, what loss do you need to make today? Have you ever even considered that the Christian life involves this kind of righteous, holy, thankful loss? The wise man understood that. I wonder if there's anything today that will get in the way of you worshipping and enjoying Christ on his day, the Lord's day, this Christmas day. If you can engage with all the festivities with Christ right there at the heart of them don't hold back on the festivities great enjoy him as the center of what you're doing <coughs> but if christ himself gets lost like a forgotten present down the back of the sofa you don't hardly think of him all day if he loses you today if he loses your heart if it's not for him if he loses your affection your attention your love your thanks then why don't you let the holy spirit bring you back to him why don't you say, I'm sorry, I, I thought I had to hold on to everything. I don't do it. I'm glad you lose it for your sake, Lord Jesus. Here's a good practice that might help you out. Uh, start off on the right foot, practically. If you're a person who normally gives thanks before you eat, I know many of you would do that. You pray and say, thank you for our foods. That's a good thing to do. Well, why not try this? Why don't you give thanks before opening your presents as well? Why don't you say, this is not just about the, the kind of secular, the kind of, you know, the, we, I've been to church this morning and now we've got my bit over here, the presence bit. Don't do that. Why don't you say, let's pause, let's stop. Who is behind all these good gifts that we have? Who gave me the money to be able to buy this for other people? Why don't we pause and say, we give thanks to all for our presence. Praise God for all your good gifts and for the joy of being able to give to others and receive from others. Why don't you pause? Do that today. Now, Putting him front and centre like that, or using your imagination to do so in some other way, completely up to you, you might lose something by doing that. You might lose by pausing to give thanks for your presence. You might lose a little bit of time. You might be doing something else. You might have lost the atmosphere of the moment by bringing Jesus in. Oh, getting more religious. But is it worth losing that to gain him? Yes, it is. You might even lose the approval of a non-Christian friend or relative who you're spending the day with. You say, you know, I've, I love the Lord Jesus. He's given us these presents. I'd, I'd love to pray to him. Yeah, what's going on? 
Mm. It's so weird, but they just wrap up. Mm. You're going to lose maybe some approval from a friend or a relative by doing that. You're going to lose something, right? Get clear. If you live for Jesus, you'll lose something and you'll gain everything. If you gain the whole world and yet, oh now here you forfeit your soul. It's a no brainer, isn't it? It ought to be. Wouldn't it be worth it if you gained Christ Himself today? Wouldn't that be a game? Let's pray that it would be. Let's pray together. Thank you for the gift of joy, Father. Thank you for the gift of worship. Thank you for the gift of loss. Pray that we'd be ready and welcoming to the joy of Christ. Give ourselves to worshipping him and even be prepared to lose what can, we can readily lose if we gain him. Help us today. Lord. May this Christmas day truly be a day of joy and blessing. May it be filled with Christ. May he not be absent today, but rather through and in everything that we do. We pray for his sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.